All right, so in this short video, we're going to talk briefly about the kinetics of binding. So far, we've only talked about affinities, um, all of which has happening at equilibrium, and we haven't learned at all about how fast that occurs. Of course, as chemists, we care a lot about how fast binding occurs because it affects how long we have to wait uh, before we can measure an interaction, and it also affects the stability of that complex over time. So for this, we need to think about kinetics, uh, and I invite you to take notes as we go through this. All right, so for here, even though in the last lesson we talked extensively about polyvalency and all kinds of fancy aggregates, here we're just going to go back to our very simple case where a monovalent receptor binds a monovalent ligand and it forms this one-to-one -one complex, okay? So we're just thinking about that um, and we're gonna have the rate constants K association and K dissociation. Um, sometimes you might also see these written as um, K on, little k on and little k off um, as an alternative way to, to distinguish them from the big uh, capital letter k a and k d okay so that that says on and off there all right so we're thinking about this and we're thinking about how does binding occur over time uh, and so it's worth just trying to draw out uh, over time now on the axis so let's say in seconds or minutes um, how does the concentration of that bound complex change over time? Uh, and you can try to draw that for yourself. Just take a second and draw it. Okay, and so at time zero, we start off with only the two free species, right, when we mix them together. And so there should be nothing at time zero, right? So we know that at, we should be starting at the origin here. Um, and then over time, these two should increase. And in fact, it, at first it looks like it's appearing to increase linearly. And then eventually we reach a point of saturation where we've consumed all of one species or the other. And so now um, uh, there, is, there is all the, the maximum amount um, of a bound complex that we can form, okay? Um, and so there's actually um, mathematical equations that can describe this process. Um, this is actually fit nicely by an exponential uh, increase curve um, that with saturation, um, but we're not going to go into that in this lesson. If you're interested, I can point you to some resources. Um, what's worth uh, knowing for us is that for antibody antigen interactions, um, there are some typical values of these rate constants. And it depends on what the antigen is and its molecular uh, weight, basically. Okay, so for these types of interactions, um, if you have a small molecule as your antigen, um, then binding can be a little bit uh, faster. And so here, um, this I'm gonna do Ka first. Okay, so for here, um, the Ka, like K on, um, is in on the order of 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8 uh, per molar per second um, in terms of binding. Okay, um, for a large molecule like a protein, so a macro molecule uh, as the antigen, um, it takes a little bit longer to bind, so it's a little bit slower. Um, this rate constant, okay? Um, but overall, these are pretty like constant. So for almost any protein, it's gonna be in this range. And this isn't that big of a range. It only spans a couple orders of magnitude. So overall, the take home message here is that your association rate constant is pretty similar um, for a given class of antigens. Um, and so, um, this doesn't really change much. And what that means is the time to form a bound complex uh, is really kind of independent of what particular protein you're binding to, okay? Um, and in fact, interestingly, um, both of these sets of, of rate constants are actually a little bit slower. Like once you, you calculate the, the real rate um, for typical concentrations, it comes out to be a little bit slower than diffusion. Um, and uh, this is interesting because it means binding tends to be diffusion limited. Um, 
And so the, the, the rate at which you can actually form a, a bound complex, let's say on the surface of a plate, for example, an ELISA plate, um, it's actually limited by the time that it takes to get the ligand there um, and has very little to do with the time that it takes to, to bind together and interact once it happens. So once it's there, um, it's going to bind. Uh, you're really limited by the, the transport. Um, oops, let me finish this. Binding is often diffusion limited. Okay. Um, and so that has a lot of uh, impacts on assay design because if you can uh, increase mixing speeds, let's say by using convection instead of diffusion, you can really um, speed up uh, the rate of binding. Okay, so um, in contrast for uh, dissociation rate constants, um, this varies a lot. Um, and this is what has the biggest impact on affinity, actually, um, the capital KD. So um, much bigger than, than any variations in Ka, okay? So in our K on, all right? So the biggest impact on, this is capital KD, all right? Um, and so, for example, it can go all the way from 10 to the minus four per second um, for a high affinity antibody, okay? Um, and note that's an actual negative sign in the exponent there that I've written, um, all the way up to 10 to the plus three per second for low affinity antibody. So this is a huge seven orders of magnitude change um, in the rate constants for dissociation. Um, and what that means is, Everything kind of binds at the same rate, but then a low affinity in antibody, the reason it's low affinity is because the, the species comes off again very quickly, whereas a high affinity antibody, it binds and then it's kind of stuck there for a while. Um, it can be stuck there for minutes even or hours uh, for the highest affinity antibodies, okay? And we can calculate how long do these complexes last um, by calculating a comp the, the half-life. So um, similar to what you may have calculated in like general chemistry for anything that has um, these exponential decay, um, we're, we're gonna use that same exponential half-life relationship. Um, so we're gonna calculate what's called T1 half, um, which is the half-life of the complex. Okay, and this, it turns out, is directly related to that dissociation rate constant, um, that little KD or K off. Um, and so the change over time, oops, so the DDT um, in the concentration of that bound complex, sorry, that looks funny, there we go, um, is just equal to minus the rate constant of loss times the concentration of the complex. Um, and so this is a first order differential equation. And once we rearrange it and integrate, we end up with um, minus the natural log of the concentration of the complex, that ratio over, in a ratio over the initial concentration of the complex, which I'm writing here with a subscript zero, um, equals KD of what time you're at minus the initial time, which is often uh, zero. Okay, and so uh, we can then say, well, at the time where um, your current concentration is equal to one half of the initial concentration, uh, then we can plug in and we get minus the natural log of one half, because that's that ratio, equals KD times um, what we're going to call T1 half, which is the time at which half, uh, half of it is gone. Um, and so now uh, we can rearrange and we get T1 half equals um, minus the log of one half, which is, oops, sorry, we don't need this anymore, 0 0.693 over KD. A little KD. Okay, so this becomes a really simple calculation. Um, once you know the, the dissociation rate constant, you can easily predict the half-life and vice versa. We can find uh, rate constants this way. So here's an example problem. Okay, um, so try this. So I'm gonna, let's say that I give you 
a vial of a high affinity antibody. Um, it has a KD of, of about a nanomolar. So that's, uh, oh, sorry, I wrote it funny. Okay, that's fine. So KD of a nanomolar. Um, and it, you can assume a typical Ka, um, little Ka, so K on. Oops. You can assume, let's say that it's 10, two times 10 to the seven per molar per second. Okay, so calculate what is uh, the K off or little KD um, and what is the half-life. Okay, so you can go ahead and pause the video and calculate those two things and then come back. All right, so hopefully you had a chance to try it. Here's the solution. So first I needed, um, I first I, I converted this um, to an association rate constant um, and then used that uh, in order to calculate little kd. You actually don't need to convert it. You could also just go straight from the dissociate of uh, the, the kd, big kd. Um, and so you should get that this rate constant for coming off is two times 10 to the minus set two, two times 10 to the minus two per second. And then the half life comes out to about half a minute, 35 seconds. So for this high affinity antibody, um, you're still fairly high affinity antibody, you're still losing your interaction in less than one minute. Um, and so you can see here why it would be a value to get an even higher affinity antibody so that things can stay on much longer. All right, so the last piece of this um, that I'd like to spend just a couple minutes on is um, how do we measure um, rate constants? And there's this could be a whole other lecture. We're not going to go into it um, in detail, but just to kind of give you a flavor, uh, if you want to measure the association rate constant, um, which is really a second order rate constant, right? Because it's um, the, the two coming together. Um, and so it, it, it has a second order. The way that we often do it is we simplify to a pseudo first order uh, situation by you hold one of these species, um, one of your reagents in great excess so that the rate constant becomes completely dependent on the reagent that is limiting and then you can calculate um, a, a pseudo first order rate constant using standard kinetic things where you just add it in and then you measure over time and you do that for different concentrations. Okay, so that's one way, um, what we call pseudo first order uh, uh, association. Okay, um, and then to measure KD, um, we which is a first order relationship, this is where we would actually have to start with the bound complex and then we measure the rate at which it falls apart. Um, and so here you, you often will set up a system where you, you, you allow things to bind and then you start measuring during a, watch, during a wash period. Um, so you measure loss of that bound complex, which means you have to have a way, whoops, loss of, of RL. Um, you have to have a way to get it bound and a way to tell that it's dissociating. Um, and we, for both of these, uh, types of measurements. We often use something, um, a technique called, uh, often abbreviated as SPR, which is surface plasmon resonance. Um, and this in general is a technique where uh, you're able to get a signal that is proportional to the mass that is bound to a surface. So we have some surface um, and it's an optical technique where you can actually get more signal if there's bigger things bound, um, including you can detect that something like an antibody bound to the surface. So we read out um, a signal that is proportional to the mass bound, okay? And so that enables you to tell when an antibody binds or an antigen binds. Um, and we often then produce curves where we, our, the signal that we're measuring is proportional, um, although not directly measuring uh, the, the bound complex, and we can watch over time. And we basically 
flow in ligand, like say you flow in something that's gonna bind and so then you can watch K association and then you stop and you start washing out just with buffer and you watch it dissociate. And so from this first part, you get uh, the K association and from this part, you get the K dissociation. Okay, so that is it. Um, here's the overview of what we covered here. Um, we've looked at um, the, the typical time course for binding, um, what typical rate constants are for association and dissociation, how to calculate half-lives, and then sort of this very brief introduction to how do people go about measuring these. And we'll talk about that more when we cover a paper in the next class period. Okay, thank you.